So today we're going to talk about a little bit how the browser works, right? It's a bit of an overview of how, what the browser actually is and how it works. We're going to talk about HTML, but it's specifically about the semantic aspect of HTML. And we're going to talk a little bit about um, universal accessibility, or what, is, what does it mean to be accessible on the web. At the end of this lecture, um, I want you to understand the model of a browser as a front-end model. So how does it enable you to, to build front-ends and graphical interfaces? I want you to be able to, to um, build uh, basic HTML documents with uh, semantically correct HTML. We're going to come to that later. I want you to be able to explain how forms in HTML documents relate to HTTP, the thing that we heard last week. And, and uh, eventually, I want you to understand how if you write correct and semantically correct HTML, it helps with accessibility. I think that's the main takeaways from this lecture today. Right? So if you look at the browser as, as more than just showing me some websites, it, what it offers you is a, a powerful, powerful declarative language for defining user interfaces. If you've ever built UIs with uh, something else than, than the web, and when I say the language, I mean HTML and CSS, it's very tedious, right? What HTML and CSS, and the browser in that case, enables you is, is uh, a rapid prototyping interface uh, the ability to include all sorts of media into your systems, and it, it's able to adapt to different screen sizes, different devices. It's, it's all around a pretty good experience if you're a designer or an implementer of, the, of these applications. And the nice thing about the browser is that pretty much everyone in the world knows how a browser works, right? The URL as, as, an, as an entry point to applications or to documents is universally accepted. People know what that means. People know what links are and, and how, they, how they work and how navigation works in, in those websites. And things like the back button, the forward button, the refresh button, and, and other, or the, the address uh, up there are things that are universally understood among people. Right? And the nice thing about the browser is that other uh, runtimes uh, often don't give you is they abstract away very complex underlying uh, things, things like rendering, networking, and so on and so forth. The limitations that come with that is that you're limited to this document-centric structure, right? And what that means is that if you look at the, if you remember the history of the web from last time, it started in the early 90s or late, late 80s, depending on how you want to look at it. And it started as a platform to share documents, right? And the way that HTML, HTML was designed and evolved is still about documents. Although nowadays, we build very powerful applications with those same things. And what that means is that the interaction models that we have, uh, if we want to extend it to the basics that we have in HTML, are kind of more difficult. The second thing is, and that's what we saw the last time, is that we are limited to a set of protocols. We're limited to, H to mostly HTTP, HTTPS, in the way we can communicate with other services. And, and that's going to be something that you will notice in the exercises, you're limited to what you can access on, your, on the computer. If you have a, a native application, you can access the whole file system usually. You can access all sorts of hardware that is on the computer. And um, the way you, you exercise those things uh, with a browser is through uh, something called a browser API. So the browser gives you a, a limited set of things you can do. If you want to go beyond that, it's very difficult to actually do. And, and this is also true if you want to access uh, things like cookies or, or local storage. Uh, you will have to go through the limited interface of the browser to do that. And last but not least, you mostly have pull communication, meaning that the server offers you resources, and you as a local document, as a front end, pull from those resources. There's one clear exception here, and maybe some of you have heard of this. It's called WebSockets. Socket, so WebSockets is a, is a mechanism for the server to push back some content. Um, unfortunately, in this lecture, we're going to be limited to talk about pull communication. And if you look at the web in, in terms of empirical studies that are out there uh, in publications, uh, I think more than 80% of the web is actually just pull communication. So let's have a quick look at the browser internals. Who, who would say they know how a browser works with respect to this model? OK, that's very, that's very few people. And that's fine, right? It's fine to not know because a browser takes some, so much away from you. But if you wanted to learn web engineering, and the engineering part is important here, I think it's important for us to, to know a little bit about how the browser works internally. Yeah? For one, it lets you debug things easier, 
And for the other, if you have certain performance issues, you might under understand why you have those. And it's going to be more important later on uh, in the semester when we hear about um, dynamically extending our website. So the one thing that we have is a user interface. And with user interface, what, what we mean is everything that we don't see in the central browser window. Things, things like the address bar, things like the, the back and forward buttons, things like the menu buttons, and so on and so forth. So that's the UI part. That's, that's I would say, the minimalistic, simple part of all of this. The browser engine, uh, usually, if, you heard, if you've heard about the browser engine before, usually what people mean when they say browser engine is both the browser engine and the rendering engine. Right? The, what the browser engine does is it translates uh, all sorts of uh, UI commands that we have from above to the rendering engine. But colloquially, when, when people say browser engine, they probably also mean the rendering engine. And that's kind of the heart of the browser. Because what the rendering engine does is, is it's responsible for everything you see on the website. It takes any sort of resource you get from a network layer, for instance. right? So a network layer handles uh, any sort of ingoing, uh, incoming and outgoing HTTP requests and responses. And whatever comes in, be it an image, a PDF, text, JSON, or HTML, it will take it in and visually represent it in a way that it thinks it's suitable. And the more complex things are obviously HTML. We're going to go over that in the next slide. So another very complex part of the browser is a JavaScript interpreter. So the browser is a runtime for a true and complete language called JavaScript. And it, it handles that within an event loop. What that means, uh, we're going to hear about um, probably in the beginning of next week or the week after that. So JavaScript is, is this whole home, uh, whole own beast uh, that is very complex and very interesting, but maybe not, not tackling it today. The UI backend is, is the translation layer between the browser and the operating system. What that means is if you see any sort of form elements, let's say you have a, a radio button or a select box or any so, uh, thing like that, anything that is standard, um, and you maybe have noticed that in, in, in many cases it looks the same as in a graphical user interface on, on your operating system. And the reason for that is that it's actually being rendered uh, by the operating system. Meaning that if I have an option or radio button that I, I put into HTML and it's being rendered by the UI backend, what that means is that um, the rendering engine goes to the UI backend and the UI backend goes to the operating system and tells them, please give me a way to render those things the way you know, know how. And that's why radio buttons, if you don't style them separately with CSS, for instance, will look differently on your iPhone than on your uh, Windows PC. And last but not least, we have the data persistence layer that handles things like cookies or local storage. So let's go through one quick example. And I would say the most complex thing that a browser renders is an HTML page. So. Let's say we have some HTML document, not this concrete one, this is a very simple one, but a more complex one, let's say uh, the one that renders our, our website. Okay? So on a very high level, you can think of, well, it takes this you know, semantically defined text that is HTML and translate, it's, it's a function that takes that and translate, translates that to a 2D representation, a visualization, if you will. Right? So what's the first thing that's going to happen? The first thing that, that happens is parsing. It's going to take the text. It's going to understand what the text means. It's going to parse that text. And, and it's going to turn it into an internal representation of that text. And the internal representation is called the DOM, the docu document object model. So we're not going to go into the details of the DOM right now. But what we'll do is uh, remember it, hopefully, because it will be important later on uh, when we talk about JavaScript. Okay, And the DOM looks a bit like this. So the DOM is a, a tree representation of our HTML. So usually we have a root object, which is this the HTML object. And, and, and then, based on that, we have a tree structure that defines our whole document. Based on that tree structure, uh, we construct a render tree. Right? What the render tree does is it takes that um, structural element of HTML, it then loops in the CSS, which is styling information, and puts it both together into something called a render tree. And that looks like this. On the left, we still have the, the DOM tree. And then we have mappings on how this DOM tree should look like. Right? 
This is still an, an internal representation, but it's something that, that the rendering engine can take, and then in the next step, um, okay, the next step is actually layouting, but the last step is painting, right? So based on the render tree, uh, there are two steps that will take place. The third is uh, layouting. Layouting is a re recursive process that, that figures out what the positions are of certain things on the site. And, oh, there's a typo right here, great. Uh, and uh, the last one is actually painting. So once we know what we have, the structure, how it looks like, the styling, and where, where, where it's at, we actually go through the painting. Okay. So if we do all that sequentially, the web will be much slower than it actually is today because we have huge documents. And, and if we want to display that sequentially, then it will take us probably sometimes minutes to display uh, information. So this whole thing is a gradual process. And what that means is that one process will not wait for the next. If parsing of the HTML document to, until the end takes too long, the rendering engine will jump in and say, well, I can al already take something in here and do something with it, right? So even though the, maybe the, the whole HTML isn't, isn't parsed yet, you'll be able to, to render partially, right? And that, is, uh, that works together with uh, continuous resource fetching. So the whole gradual process could also only work that uh, if um, all the resources that you get within the HTML document, things like images, things like CSS, th things like, um, things like ja JavaScript files, uh, will load in the background. And as they, as they load, they will appear. You will not wait for all the images on the site to, to load before you actually uh, render something. And if we go back to the browser for a second, uh, we saw that last time, if you opened, uh, let's, oh, let, this time let's open standards, right? Um, let's go to the developer tools. And let's load this again. So here we see all the network information, right? And we see, oh, we see, you know, hundreds of, not, not hundreds, but tens of files in this case loading, right? So th those, I didn't tell, if I go to the standard.t, I don't specifically say load all those things. Within this document, there are certain other files defined that are being fetched through that. But if we go to any other site, Presse for instance, even though a, lot of, a bunch of things in the background are still loading, I can already see the page. And that's a gradual process I'm talking about, right? You can still see things loading here, but I'm, I'm already being able to scroll here and see most of the page, okay? And what you see here in, the, in this sector is something called the waterfall. It shows you the, the synchronous and asynchronous processes that are going on. Uh, no question, okay. Okay. All right, any questions on how the browser works? Is it, is it sort of clear on, on what's going on once we say, you know, open the standard today? Okay, fantastic. Okay, so with that, with, that, with that basic understanding of how the browser works, I wanna move on to what drives this whole process, uh, namely HTML. And the HTML is the structure, uh, the basic structure of how the web works. And specifically, I, I wanna emphasize the semantic part here. Because HTML, can be written in a way that has no meaning at all, right? But we want to write HTML in the way that uh, it has meaning for all sorts of users of, um, of, that, of that document. So, oh, okay, maybe a quick, quick uh, show of hands. Who has done the pre-reading? Oh, fantastic, okay, that's great. Most people, not all people though. <laughs> so for those of you who ha have not done it, please go ahead and do it. We, go we will quickly grow, go through HTML now, but if you've done the pre-reading, uh, you already know more about the details of the different elements we're gonna talk about. But for those of you who have done SSD, and for those who are currently doing it, you've probably heard of XML. And HTML is this, is this kind of uh, subset of, of, of XML uh, that's called the hypertext markup language. And what it is, is a markup language, right? It defines semantic structure of a document. And the way it does that is, it has this thing called a tag name of an element, uh, text, so those elements can have attributes and contents. And, and, that's a, and then what you can also do is you can nest th those, those um, 
elements, and that's how you get the tree structure we talked about before in the, in the document object model. And this, this structure of HTML can be used by, by, by humans, right? If we, if we render it through our browser, then we can see certain things, and that's nice, and we can see it as humans, but it's also used by other, uh, by other entities, like machines. And we're going to skip through the whole history of HTML because it's messy, okay? So let, let's forget about 20, 30 years of the evolution of HTML and talk about HTML5. Because HTML5 is, is the newest iteration of HTML. And I think for this course, we shouldn't worry ourselves with re legacy too much, but we should, we should focus on what's possible today. And most browsers nowadays um, support HTML5. And the idea of HTML5 was uh, going from simply is describing things like documents to moving to applications. Yes? Uh, does the Internet Explorer support HTML5? I didn't hear the first part. Did you say Internet Explorer? Um, there's a site that tells us that, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, so uh, honestly, I'm not super well versed with Internet Explorer. Uh, but there's a new browser called Edge from Microsoft, and that one definitely supports HTML5, right? Yes, another question. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Does it use it? Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, so, so the comment up there was that Internet Explorer does support HTML5. If there are any comp compatibility issues, is CSS and, and JavaScript. Thank you. Uh, f I would say for this course, focus on Chrome right now, just because you're already learning a lot, and Chrome I is available on all platforms, and it's, it's the browser we're actually using for testing on our side as well. But yeah, but HTML5 has, has been sort of this, this converging towards a, a standard that, that people, like a lot of people in the W3C, the World Wide Web Consortium, think is, is pretty good. And it's the newest version. Uh, I, I would say let's focus on that one in this lecture. And the basic structure lo looks like this. Maybe a lot of you have already seen it. You have this thing called the document type, which is the, the, the top up there. You have the document element, which is the, the tag HTML. Then we start out with a head that, similar to HTTP, has certain uh, meta information, things like the, the chart set, things like the author, title. Uh, sometimes in there you also have uh, a link to the styling information. And then in, in the body is the thing you actually see within your uh, window, right? In this case, the body is very simple. We have a heading of the, of the first order, H1, and we have a paragraph, and that's it, right? So just to quickly go through one slide of legacy, uh, in, the, in the past, or if you open any sort of website on the internet, you will see all of these here, right? You'll see all sorts of different headers, and what they did is tell the browser which version of HTML to use for parsing and for in interpreting and so on and so forth, right? Again, the only important one for this course is the HTML5 one. Just think about that. But if you do see those other things in the web and you ask yourself why, why do you need all of those things, it's because we had something called the browser war at some point, meaning that certain vendors thought uh, they know how to do it better and you know, had different implementations for different things and we have different variants of, of different specifications and so on and so forth. So there's one field called, called the quirks mode and the quirks mode, if you, if you hear it at some point, just means that um, the layout this, that is being rendered mimics non-standard behavior. And that's why it has this, this interesting name, Quirks Mode. But that's all the legacy I want to talk to you about today. Uh, for the, this course and in the exercise, let's just use the, the HTML5 one. Okay. And as said before, um, the head is, is not really visible except in the, in the title page. It's just meta information for things like crawlers and, and the browser itself to do things, right? Um, and also information on the head you can, you can access through JavaScript. Now, the way that elements work is that they have those attributes, 
And the attributes tell the, elem, tell the browser or any sort of other parser that, that works with the HTML how to render certain things or, or how to uh, interpret certain, certain things about the element. Now here we have a generic div element, and those are things that you have or you can have on every element. ID is something that identifies this one particular element. It has to be unique, meaning that there can be only one of the, one of the same ID in the same document. Right? The second one is uh, something called class. Class identifies um, uh, certain elements that belong to a category that you can style. So class is something you can access then in CSS. Uh, title is something that is being displayed as a tooltip. So if you hover over the element, you will see it as a tooltip. Uh, language is, is this thing that is barely used, actually, but uh, you can specify to specify the language of the, of the certain element. Then you have those data star things. Data star is interesting because it's uh, a well-formed attribute on every element. And what it means is that uh, you can attach any sort of data attribute to any sort of element, and that becomes important later in JavaScript. So if you want to introduce certain, certain um, unique att uh, attributes that are not covered by the HTML standard, you can say, well, I'm going to add a data attribute. And it introduces that, and it's still a well-informed HTML. And then last but not least, you have the, co the content block. Right? So content is uh, either text, you should just type text in there, then it's a text node, or it's, um, it's any sort of other element that is allowed within that element. Right? So not every element is allowed within certain elements, but we're going to talk about that in a few slides. Okay. Now, let's talk about semantics a little bit. If you write HTML in some way, and you go into the browser and have a look at it, it will have some standard representation. It will look a certain way. Now, the thing is, the semantics of what you see is not given by how something looks in standard representation. Yeah? This is a kind, of, kind of a beginner mistake that, that people make. And it's, it's sort of detrimental uh, to people who, are, uh, who rely on other, other devices as a browser or as a standard browser that you use, right? So if you use H1, it should be the first order header within your document. It should be the only thing that, that, the only header in your document, and it shouldn't be used to print thick text, right? Um, people use B to print text bold. B is actually depreciated uh, for a long time, and now people use EM to emphasize text. If you want to have a certain representation in terms of visual representation, you have to then go into CSS and style it. But if you think about designing your, your or structuring your, your document, what you should think about is um, what does it say about my element in there? Yeah. Yes, this question. Oh, you mean as in the example before? Like having the style in? Oh, um, so the question is, does it ever make sense to overwrite the style of a, of a standard um, element? Yeah, uh, whenever you want, basically. Um, yeah, no, so the, the style is, is what you want it to have. It shouldn't be a mismatch in the end. So if you have an H1 and you, you format it in a way that doesn't, it, where it's not emphasized and, and looked at as a, as a header of forced ordering, ordering, then it has some usability issues. But theoretically, if, you, if your style guide, for some reason, uh, tells you that certain elements should look a certain way, then override any way you want. But you sh it shouldn't be a semantic mismatch of what you see and what you have in terms of structure. Yeah. Yes? Right, so the, que the question is, uh, does, it, does it make sense to introduce 
uh, semantically maybe ambiguous um, stylings uh, even because of search engine optimization, SEO. I mean, you gotta do what you gotta do to, to get your site up, up on Google, sure. But I, I would say it's, it's a trade-off between having your site higher up on Google and then having, for instance, uh, screen readers interpret your site in a wrong way. And that's a trade-off you have to decide on. I, think, I don't think there's a right and wrong on, on how you do those things. I think it's always a trade-off that you need to be aware of. Yeah. yeah. But that, yeah, that brings me to, to the second point here. Um, the reason we, we want to use semantically correct things is because uh, it's not only visually, uh, um, you know, people that, that have perfect vision and perfect hearing looking at your things, uh, people with all different sorts of disabilities or, or abilities uh, will look at your things and the semantics of your HTML will be a, a, one of the determinators of whether they can, uh, are able to, to access those things, right? Okay. Right. So, and, and this is also something new that, that was sort of introduced with HTML5, but was also there before that, is, is this very common document structure. Usually what you have in the document is, is a header, you have some navigation, you have maybe a couple of sections and articles, uh, and a footer. And then maybe sometimes you have this thing called a side, which is, is a sidebar. Um, now, ag again, those are not set in stone, right? Not every section has to have an article. Um, articles can have other sections. It's not quite clear how those things are nested and how those things um, uh, work together, right? It's, it's not always straightforward. And, and I, I, if I look at a document, I can't always tell you whether something is correct or not because it depends on the, in the way that, that the, the site owners wanna, wanna guide navigation within those things. Uh, what I can tell you is that if you use, use more generic um, elements, such as diff, in this case, uh, you will have a harder time maintaining and a har harder time uh, transporting the semantics of those things. So instead of using a diff, for instance, for your navigation, you should opt for using nav. I instead of using uh, a P for your article, use an actual article. Because what, what that does is it, it helps um, devices like screen readers uh, to to uh, better make sense of what's going on within the page. That's the only information they have, right? The only information, uh, not the only, but the first information that uh, all those other devices, like screen readers or, or text uh, browsers get, is the way you, st you structure your HTML sites. Now, there are certain things that, that uh, in this case, are actually visual. And um, uh, one thing is this distinction between block and inline elements. A block element is, is something that can contain things that are also other block elements or inline elements. Things like a div, things like a, a paragraph, things like a section can contain other sections, can contain other divs, and so on and so forth. Now, inline elements, uh, and, okay, and the block elements take the full width, right? So this is something you, you should try out. You should, you should go into your uh, favorite HTML editor, uh, put in a block element, maybe put in a, a border so you can see uh, the dimensions properly and see what happens in terms of width and height and, and stuff like that. The good thing about block elements is that you can also take on a width. Uh, inline elements, on the other hand, are something that, that are, are within uh, the text, for instance. So things like uh, a link, things like an emphasis a tag, uh, things like a strong tag, a span, and so on and so forth, are things that are within um, block elements usually, or other span, uh, sorry, other inline elements. And what that means is it's semantically incorrect to put a diff, for instance, within a link, right? You, you can't do that. The browser will still take it, and that's as an aside, the browser, to cite my high school teacher, will take any crap, right? The browser is very resilient, so whatever you write to the browser, the browser will try to, to gracefully uh, display whatever they think you want to do. Right? So only because the browser t uh, still dis displays something doesn't mean it's good or correct. Just, just FYI. So. Oh yeah, so, so uh, I talked about this quite, quite a bit, but I'm <laughs> introducing it maybe a bit too late. Uh, the tags div and span 
are just generic elements uh, for block or inline elements, right? And you should only use them if there's nothing left. If you can't think of, of any other tag that might be uh, more uh, uh, sensical in, in that case, you can use div or span to attach some style information or to add a certain structure within your element. But if you can think of, if you, you can go through the elements and see, well, this does make more sense, use it because the semantic information that gets transported based on that other element can help other devices. Okay. And these are some examples. If, you, if you've gone through the, the pre-reading, uh, you've gone through all of those. Um, just very standard things of, of, uh, of possibilities to group certain things. Um, I think the, the most commonly used is definitely the paragraph, where you can add some, some paragraph text. Uh, maybe uh, another interesting one is the lists. You can have ordered lists and unordered lists. And yeah, I would say those are things that you learn by doing. If I just show them to you now, it's not something that, that you can actually take away with you. So links and anchors are, are, are sort of interesting uh, because the way that the, historically the web was designed was, was um, for links to be the main attraction, right? Links are the things, and it, it's still kind of like that, right? It, but if you, if you think back to, to Tim Berners-Lee and the information system that, that he envisioned, uh, it was about linking different documents together. And now we have two distinctions here. The one link we can have is the link to other, other sites, to other resources. And that's the links that you probably already know. You link to um, the shopping cart. You link to uh, just another website, right? Or you link to, to uh, an image or a video or whatever have you, right? So these are the general links that you see um, the top here, the W3 link, right? The HTML standard. And then there's something that we talked about last time uh, with the URLs. You have something called resources. Uh, not resources, what is it called? Uh, fragments. Uh, you have something called, within a resource, you can have a fragment. And that's, in HTML language, it, it's an anchor, right? So, or the anchor is a link to a fragment. So if, if you have something uh, like the timetable down there, and that's an example from the actual uh, website that we have, uh, you link to a, a certain position or a certain element, actually, within your HTML document. And now we come to something that is a bit more interesting, I would say. We come to forms. Because forms uh, in HTML give you a way of interacting uh, with the website. It, it's the first uh, interactive element in the insights that, uh, that um, you're able to do without doing any JavaScript. Right? You, can, you can give the user the ability to, to uh, insert some data uh, without using any sort of JavaScript. And again, I would urge you to go through the pre-reading, uh, to, to go through that a little bit. But the way a form works is that you have all sorts of input elements. That, that can be a text box, that can be um, a radio box, that can be a select, and so on and so forth. And then, in order to send the data to a resource, you have something called a submit uh, button. Now, there can be two things here. There can be buttons, and there can be those, uh, this input type submit. And the difference is very subtle, uh, because uh, buttons are us usually introduced when, j when you use JavaScript. So we're going to do that. For now, let's focus on the, on the submit input. And it looks like the top one up there. Right. Oh, there's one more thing that, that I want to introduce. If you want to group together a, a subset of the elements, you can use something called a field set. And a field set can have a legend that, that tells you what the description of, the, of that uh, group of things is. And then in there, um, you can have any sort of element. And maybe just quickly to, to point that out, uh, in this case, uh, we have the field set for your favorite course. And I think the choice is obvious, but you can, you can take it. Um, you have web engineering and semi-structured data. The name of those two things is the same, because it's one field you want to send. Right? If you have different names for these things, you will get diff two different parameters sent. But I think for that to make sense, we should t uh, look at an example, right? Okay, let's look at an example. Um, let's just copy paste this into. Um, oh yeah, already have a form here. 
Oh, this is a different form. Uh, but still works. Is that okay? Maybe the Okay, so I prepared a form uh, before the lecture, but that's actually, I don't know what that was. Okay. All right, this is not well formed, but for now, actually, let's just do this. Okay, so I'm not sure what that is. I hope it's not me. Yes. Is there a question? I, I can see you. Can you? Oh, yeah, here. So. Maybe it is. So, the thing is, if you are HDMI, you can't mute usually. Let's try. Oh, you can. There you go. Sounds good. Thank you. Ah. OK, good. We figured it out. Thank you for troubleshooting. So, um, I had some, some requests been open here. I don't know what, which one it is, so I'm going to just remove this. Okay, let's open a request bin. Okay, but I have muted it, so I don't know what's happening. But I, I will I'll be careful with the tap button. Sorry about that. Okay, so now we have this here. Oh, I don't have a submit button, so that would not work. So let's add a submit button. <laughs> I, <laughs> what? Okay, I will not use the tap button anymore. It will hurt, but I will survive. It's actually... Oh, Michael, it was a tap button. Okay. Yeah. It's fine. I'm just going to not use the tap button. Uh, anyway, this, people, this is Michael Schroeder. Uh, he is uh, responsible for the exercises. That's my fault. E exactly. I just wanted to say that. If, if they're too hard, it's, it's him, mostly. OK. OK, so now if we go back to the browser. We have a submit button now. OK, so now if I, if I don't check anything, what will happen? Right? So I, I'm sending those things here. Let's say submit. Right? I get a success. That's good. And here we'll see a post. That's also good. So what happened is that we get nothing. If you have radio buttons with, with certain data and yet you have no data, like you have nothing filled out, then it will send nothing. Okay. If we go back to this thing here and go back, if we select web engineering, obviously, and say submit, we also get a true. And we should get another post. OK. Course on. This shouldn't be it. Oh, no. OK. 
Um, too many tabs open. Ah, oh, I forgot. To, I forgot to put values. Okay, so there's a bug already in my slides, but good to know. Um, I have to put values here. The value of web engineering, and the value here is. Although I'm not, I'm, not I'm not entirely sure if that's how input buttons work anymore. Just try it? Okay, let's just try it. Okay, and this is SSD. Because I'm afraid that now it will just uh, do something nonsensical. Let's try this. Okay, there you go. So you have to write a value. And the thing is, if I, uh huh, <laughs> what's going on? Interesting. <laughs> good, good, nice. Hello, everyone. Nice. I, I'm not opposed to that at all. If you want to post messages, go ahead. Just don't be vulgar. Um, <laughs> I know. Okay, so maybe one more thing that, that I want to mention here is the label part. So what, what we could have done is just have this without a label, right? So if you just remove this here, right, and you just have web engineering, and we go back here, then it's the same thing for us. The problem is that if you don't have uh, uh, strict labels, and we, I'm going to show an uh, example later, um, Right now, it makes sense for us because it's just it's just visually put next to the radio button. If you don't have a label for something, uh, a screen reader usually what it does is it linearizes those things. It puts them sequentially next to another, and then it's, if you have multiple fields, it's difficult to assess which one you're actually uh, pressing on if you're not using a, a visual browser. So, what I would urge you is to always have those labels on here, and that and that's a semantic notion I'm, I'm trying to. Uh, I would say um, transport here. Okay, let's go back to the slides. Okay. Yes, Simon, right? There you go. I'm going to remember some of the names here. Okay, good, good question. Uh, why is the text of, of the Submit button put as a as an attribute, the value in this case, and not as a content of that of that element. And the reason for that is legacy, mostly. So that's the way it was designed in HTML one point something, and that's the way it stayed uh, on. Although I'm, I'm not quite sure if they changed it now, but if you look at most of the examples out there, uh, it's still like that. And the value um, that you transmit should be actually part of the. Ah, oh, oh man, I, I don't even want to see it. Oh no, it's not too bad. <laughs> mm, no, that's not the one. No, it's also not the one. Wait. Ah, right, there you go. Um, is that transmitted? Okay, but but I th I think if if you use another input that is similar, it's it's being transmitted, right? Okay. I mean, let's let's just try it. But I'm I'm pretty sure. That because of uh, legacy reasons, it doesn't work like that. I don't think that will work, but I don't know. Let's try. There is? Oh, there you go. Yes, so, so uh, Michael's saying something correct. So, so this, so as soon as you have input type submit, it will do that automatically, right? And as, as I put content in there, because the browser takes anything, it will try to render it anyway, right? I mean, just think about it. In any, any other programming language, e even if it's declarative, if you do something that is not to the T of the specification, what will happen? It will blow up in your face, right? It will tell you you're an idiot and you should do it again and, tr and don't forget the semicolons, okay? That's what all the other languages do. The browser in HTML um, 
And I think that's one of the reasons why it's grown so much, especially in like the early 2000s, where, where no one really knew what they did, is because it's so resilient. Even if I do something that is incorrect, and quite frankly, I will definitely do something that is incorrect here uh, when I do a live uh, demonstration, it will take it and it will, it will show it to the, to the best way possible, right? Okay. Oh yeah, so we, we, we already kind of did that. <laughs> okay. So what, what happens when you send a form, we already saw it. Um, what happens is that all the inputs that you have in the form will be bundled as, as a, in the message body and will, will send, be sent over post, right? And the thing is, uh, HTML forms only support get or post. You will not be able to, to send a put request or delete request over a form. If you want to do that, there are possibilities to do that with, with JavaScript, and we'll come to that in about two lectures. But if you want to send data over a form, uh, only get and post is possible. So let, let's actually uh, go back to our example. Uh, let's look at the other example, the form. So the form is very simple. It's, it's the one that's actually also shown here. And it, ha just, has, it just has a username. So if we open, nope. If you open, <laughs> last time, I, I promise. Okay, so, and I think in this case it was, uh, oh yeah, so this is, yes. So I tried it out, and this is a different one. Let's, um, what was the other one called, option? <laughs> sorry, sorry about that. Uh, ah, radio. Okay. What? <sighs> Whatever. Okay. Uh, there was a question, or maybe a, a plea for not pressing the tap button again. Sorry. <laughs> copy this. So if you put method put into your form, it will just translate it into a get. That's, that's the graceful degradation that it does. Even though it's completely illegal, it will take whatever you give it and, and, and gracefully make something out of it. So if we go back to the form and we... And we add our new endpoint, and we add get to this one. Okay. What will happen is that, oh, let's, you can already see it here, right? It will just attach all the input elements uh, to the URL. Okay, you, can't, you probably can't see it. Let me just open this up in the notes or something. What happens is if, if, you, if you use the form uh, with a get method, it will just attach a question mark and then we'll, it will put an associative array um, serialized as key equals value and then the and here, right? And it will look like this. And the same thing basically happens with post, but what you have is everything after, after the question mark will be part of the message body. And if you look here, where is it? Request bin. Wow, okay. There's something seriously wrong here. Mm. All right, maybe I should, I should start a new one. Oh no, there it is, right? Now we can see this here. And in this case, for some reason, the submit button is part of the, the payload, right? That's fine. Okay, so in terms of slides, we basically went through all of this, right? So what happens in a server perspective is, is that the server gets that request on the resource 
with the parameters, does something with it, and gives something back. In this case, if we look at the response that we get from request bin, it's just a success message. We just get this, this here, right? That was, that was not the tab this time, something else. <laughs> Okay, but it can also be, so usually what you will do is, if you send a form somewhere, it will, it will parse the parameters, it will do something with the, with the parameters, and will send back some message. That message can be an HTML, can be a JSON, can be whatever you want, right? In this particular example, it's an HTML message that says, hi, first name that you provided, thank you for using the application. Okay. Are there any questions on the, on the form part? Maybe one last thing I want to show in the request bin. Up. In the headers is the content type. So the content type is interesting because it's this, this weird thing here called application x dot 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 form URL encoded. That's just a fun fact, right? So every time you send uh, data over a form, the the server will know based on the header, because that's the header that the browser will send with it. If you don't want to have that header in there, you have to send your request over JavaScript. Okay. So any last questions on, on forms, maybe, on HTML in general? Does everyone know HTML? Yes. Okay, right. Um, so, so maybe today even, or but probably next time we will go into into those issues, things like positioning and things like stuff like that with CSS. Okay. Oh, the the question what the question was is there any good way to to center? Uh, uh, center what? Oh, to center vertically inside. Oh, that's that's a good question. So over the last twenty years people have struggled to, to center stuff vertically in HTML and CSS. And next time, I will show you how to do it. Okay. Okay, so accessibility, yes. Okay, so, so there's a comment that's, um, uh, what's your name? Uh, Andy. Andy? Yeah. Okay, there's so a comment from Andy. There's apparently a website because this is a huge issue where you can say how to center things in HTML and CSS, and then you graphically tell it how to do it, and it will generate code for you, right? But because we're web engineers, we should know it ourselves. Okay. So the last part of the lecture will be about accessibility. And in accessibility, I want to talk about designing and building uh, experiences on the web uh, for universal access. And accessibility in that sense I think it starts with the question of who are we designing for? And we are designing for hopefully everyone, right? As much as possible. And if I say everyone, I mean people with dis disabilities of different forms, be it physical, mental, even temporary injuries, uh, or even non-native speakers, right? The problem is who is our reference point, right? Our reference point is usually ourselves. And on average, ourselves means people that are able-bodied, uh, do not have me mental disabilities, and so on and so forth. All the people in the room here uh, are certainly biased towards a certain point of view when designing user experiences, right? So intrinsically, it's hard for us to design for other people because we only have this frame of reference most of the time, right? And if you think about common disabilities that, that pertain, are pertaining in the web, you have vision problems, you have hearing problems, you have certain movement problems, and oftentimes you also have breathing difficulty. Okay. People, are there questions in the room? Okay. Uh, no. So, because we, we usually only design for ourselves, um, standardized guidelines, such as the ones I'm going to talk about today, uh, can help us design these universal experiences, right? So things that, that take us out of our frame and tell us, well, 
have you thought about this? And have you thought about that? Right? And those guidelines are, are something we're going to talk about. And there are a couple of guidelines um, that are uh, under the umbrella of the W3C. And specifically, the ones that are important for us right now when designing for other people is the web content accessibility guidelines and the accessible rich internet applications guidelines. But today, we're going to focus on the first one. And this is a kind of a reference site. So the, the web content accessibility guidelines um, have been around since 1999. So th people have thought about that for a long time now. And it's, it's been evolved um, a couple times in minor versions, but only twice in, in a major version. So currently, what we have is uh, the web content accessibility guidelines 2.0. Right? And uh, so, so again, this slide is, is more of a reference slide. Uh, go at it. If you want to check your uh, design or your implementation towards certain standards, uh, there are websites that do that for you. Um, there are certain uh, screen readers you can take. Um, my favorite one is actually Fangs. Fangs is a, is a, um, a plugin for Firefox that you can enable, and it, it emulates the experience of a screen reader for you. Right? The other one that I think is interesting is, is um, the text browser, Lynx. So who has heard of Lynx before? Oh, man. OK, I have to sh actually show it then. Um, I think I currently don't have Lynx installed. Nope. Let's, uh, huh? No, it didn't work. Um, All right, there you go. So this is browser called Lynx, L-Y-N-X, and I'll put it in the reference. And it's a text browser, meaning that if I go to, um, let's go a simple site, Google, all right? Oh, great. It, it, it will show you how unusable a site is. It's, it's a good proxy to show you how unusable a site is for people who don't have a, a standard modern web browser. Right? And if we go through all, yes, and here, if you go through all the cookies, great, yes, allow this cookie. <laughs> I think always. See? Uh, yes, there you go. Okay. But it, it, it shows you um, whether your site, I think it's, it's especially good for navigation. It shows you how tedious certain things are for people. Uh, who don't have the same affordances that you have, um, especially uh, a visual 2D web browser, right? And let's go to images. Right. No. Up, up, up. Um, web engineering. Right. Uh, there you go. All those cookies. Okay. And the and. And you can see that even with Google, that is a very minimalistic page, uh, things can be very tedious. Right? Uh, let's actually quit. Uh, let's have a look at another one. Um, any site? This. Okay. Oof. Oof. Okay. It's actually quite okay. Right. Okay. Actually, not too bad. I I, I would have thought worse too. <laughs> right. So if we go through um, search, let's see. What? Ah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's 
41 hits. All right. Oh, yeah, there you go. All right, it's not too bad. Um, let's go to another one. So the one that I, I actually had in mind was, was some newspaper, because they, those are usually terrible. Uh, let's say New York Times. Sure. Th those might actually, might actually be good, because New York Times has its own accessibility group, I think. But let's. Nice. OK, good. Uh, OK, let's try this one. Because I think that worked before. There. Yeah. You, so all this cookie stuff is interesting, obviously, right? Huh. So this is kind of a terrible side now, because I don't know what to do here. Right? There's no content that's showing me. If, if you compare it to the actual site that's going on here, it's definitely not the same user experience. Right? <laughs> and, th and this is what, what things like links, but also fangs in some way, shows you. It gives you a first impression and a good proxy, not a good proxy, but, but some proxy uh, of how it is uh, to use those things if you don't have the same affordances. And I think it's an interesting kind of tool to, to use. Yes? Also in links? For which one? Oh, interesting. OK. Interesting. But the thing is that, that uh, so the, the comment was that if you go to the standard, for instance, for the first time, it will show you the, pop, the, the cookie uh, pop up and nothing else. Right? Um, and I, I guess the argument you want to make is it, it shows you the same experience. Yeah, right? So if, but if you looked at the other sites, you, you had different mechanisms to deal with the cookies, right? That, that, that was separated for the actual output. I, I think that's a better way of dealing with that. Although I'm not, I'm not quite sure whether that's always possible. Okay. But yeah, let's quickly go through uh, the different sorts of principles that the, the, the content accessibility guidelines give us. And the first principle is, um, is there any content on the site that cannot be perceived in the same way, given different affordances, right? Let's say uh, you have an image, but you have people who are visually impaired visiting your site. So th that's the standard thing you, you usually do. Uh, I think that's what a lot of people actually do, is use the alternative text, right? So you have this thing in, in your HTML called the alt attribute, and it stands for alternative, meaning that if someone cannot display this element in the way it's supposed to be displayed uh, in its first kind of version, uh, show this other um, alternative thing. Usually it's a text, right? The other thing is, uh, if you think about um, perceivability, don't rely on only on color. And that's more of a usability thing in general. So if you've done any sort of usability engineering, you've probably heard that before also. Um, people who are visually impaired in, in, let's say, in the dimension of color blindness uh, will thank you if you emphasize certain things, not only by color, but also by semantic elements, right? And here is where things like strong or EM come into play. The second thing is uh, operability. Don't assume that everyone has a, key uh, has a mouse and a keyboard, right? Or usually people have some sort of keyboard, right? So if you, if you look back, and I think that's also a good proxy for links, there's no way I could, I could uh, freely operate uh, and, and relative and absolute position my mouse anywhere on the page. So uh, ask yourself, can all the functions on the site be performed with a keyboard? And is it actually easy to perform them? Or do I have to step through 20 navigation elements to get to the thing that I actually want on that particular page? Right? So yeah, so that's what we, we looked at before. So I think for that, especially for navigation structures, it's, it's good to work with things like links or, or fangs uh, to, to determine those issues with, with the keyboard uh, navigation. And if there's anything that might be uh, sensitive to people with seizures, uh, things like blinking, things like moving or stuff like that, 
uh, make sure that people are able to control uh, the, the, the cadence or the, the way of movement uh, of that thing to avoid those uh, conditions. Then understandability is, is a bit more subjective, I would say, but it's something that to keep in mind uh, for people with mental disabilities is, uh, is your text readable? Are the things that you do on your website predictable in the way that we talked about in the beginning? The browser in itself is predictable because it, it affords us this, this thinking of links and documents, right? If you do something completely differently, then pe maybe people will not be able to follow what you're doing, right? Um, and then the robustness is something that, that uh, the browser kind of does for you a little bit. The, the browser, uh, with a lot of mistakes that you might make in your HTML and CSS, it will gracefully degradate. But think about comp compatibility with other devices, right? And for that, I, I think that the, the only way you, you can actually uh, do that is actually test on different sorts of devices that you, you might have, uh, different operating systems and different modes of operation. And with modes of operation, I, I mean uh, entry points into, the, into your application as well as what we said before with only using the keyboard, um, only using voice, for instance, to, to navigate. And then that, that's something that probably requires uh, our own lecture is design for performance. We're not going to have the time for in this intro lecture, uh, intro course to, to go into that, but think that not everyone has uh, a high speed internet connection, right? Especially in, 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 in countries like Brazil or parts of Africa or Asia, uh, not everyone has 3G or LTE. And the other hand is also not everyone has powerful devices. So both when you're designing for your backend, where network speed comes into play, but also for your front end, where uh, rendering comes into play, think about uh, all those things. And these are so, some examples that, that come from, um, let me see, there was a the source somewhere. Uh, some examples of how to do, how to um, underline certain things, how, how to enhance certain, certain um, let's say, uh, elements in your page should be more accessible. Um, the one is using CSS to, to hide uh, a portion of, of elements in the screen if they're not necessary for s certain other devices. Another one is to add alternative text. And then uh, what, what I said over and over again, add semantic markup, right? So in the lower case, uh, add things like em uh, EMs to, to add emphasis don't only change the color or make it bold or stuff like that. And I want to give one last example here. And then who wants to start with CSS today already? <laughs> OK, quite a few people. Who wants to leave early? I, I mean, more people want to do CSS. OK. <laughs> so let's go through this example and then maybe just start uh, start talking about CSS. So if, if you look at this very naive example, it looks kind of terrible and bad, but it, I can tell you more than 50% of the web looks like that, right? And if you look at the, uh, at the outcome of it, it looks okay, actually. So within your, the regular standard browser that you have, it might look, actually look okay, but there are certain things that are not great with it. Because most of the time, what the screen reader will do let's say for fangs, but even uh, for links, is it will serialize uh, the way that the, the inputs will look like. And let's say you have 15 fields in a row, or more sometimes, and you don't know where the labels are. So if you don't have a semantic connection from the label to the actual input, a screen, uh, people who are using a screen reader will not actually know what the input uh, means that you're, they're typing something into, right? The second example here is if you are suffering from color blindness uh, or myopia, it might look something like the second image here, right? So be aware of the contrast that you're using. And last but not least, the, um, what's my name? Oh yeah, so if we, and that's a pet peeve of mine especially, uh, because it also is terrible for machines crawling your, your input, so things like search engine optimization. If you say click here, and there's no semantic information of what here actually means, people will not know what it is, 